All right, folks. There's a story to be told about this thing. <laughs> I feel so weak and puny. I'm, I'm an embarrassment to my testosterone here. But this thing is called a man hammer. And we had a retreat this weekend at Bluegrass Christian Camp. There was about, oh, probably about 100 men from all over central Kentucky or the area churches, Broadway, Southland. Uh, our church took a team of 13. And over the course of the weekend, there's a part of them. Not everybody was able to be there at the end. But um, you... We had a couple of case studies on uh, how to disciple make like Jesus did, and we looked at the life of Nicodemus. We looked at another case study, the woman at the well, and it was a great time of study and just some aha moments, I trust. We had worship. It's really cool to hear a hundred men kind of belting it out. I mean, like this morning, it was great worship. Glad all y'all were here. I appreciate the turn the volume up so I can sing as loud as I want. Nobody has to listen to me, you know, like you do on the radio. But to get a hundred men in a little chapel at uh, the camp, it was pretty special and pretty cool. And so if you weren't there, you missed out. But not only did we do that, we also had a lot of games and competitions among all the different churches. And so we had skeet shooting and we had tomahawk throwing and you had uh, archery, 3D, you shooting at all the different targets. We had uh, participation points if you were brave enough to do the zip line and the big swing that takes you out over the valley. I didn't bring all those pictures because it just happened last night. We just got home. But uh, it was a lot of fun. Anyway, to say all that to say, our men won the competitions, and we keep the man hammer. We get to keep that all year. I don't know what that really means, except it's going to take up space in the corner of my office. But uh, anyway, it was special and it was fun. And I say all of those things to say, men, if you're running around here and you've not connected with, these type of opportunities are a great way to make some new friends. And it was a great weekend, so you missed out. There'll be other opportunities. We try to do something like that every year. And so just maybe push yourself out of your comfort zone a little bit. Even things like the breakfast we're getting ready to have next week, come have breakfast. Come sit with a bunch of guys. Bring a buddy so you feel like, okay, at least I know somebody. But uh, we'd love to have you join us on those type of opportunities. If you're new to our church, we're glad you're here. We're honored that you've chosen to worship with us. We know you don't have to. You don't have to come back any week that you don't want to. But our challenge is, if you are new in our church, is to, what is it? Try five. Try five. Give us a few Sundays. Get to know who we are. Kind of create and find some friendships and see if we're not a place that uh, we can be a, a source of encouragement for your family because we want to be. We're not a perfect church. We don't have it all figured out. Yes, we are getting ready to go into a capital campaign. Glad you're here. If it's your first Sunday today, we're talking about giving, which breaks every preacher out in a cold sweat because you just hate to do that when you have guests. But... That is where we are as a church. Our church is trying to raise enough uh, support to renovate uh, our building and our property and our parking lot. And I can tell you all about it, but not this morning. Uh, if you want to come back this evening, we've had three vision nights for the congregation. We have one tonight. It's our last one, actually. So if you're new around here, come. There'll be some refreshments of some kind. Uh, we'll talk about the, the goals, the challenges, the things that we're hoping to do within our property and our building, mostly to create space, to create parking, and all of those things as we continue to grow. It is exciting. I do tell all of our guests, this is a conversation for our church family and for our members and the people who hang their hat here. If you're a guest of ours, we don't expect you to fill out this commitment card next week. But for our church family, we are praying that everyone will participate in some capacity. And so next week is a big deal for us. It is our commitment Sunday. We're going to be challenging one another to do sacrificially what we can. We can't all do the same thing, but we can all do something. And so uh, the challenge is to be courageous in our giving. Next week, we will take up an offering. We're asking our church family to give as courageously as you can the, the largest one-time gift that you've ever given to the church. We're going to use all of those gifts to kind of launch and start to order and start to prepare for the renovations. Y'all know how this works. You know, we, we, it's hard to get things in here. Just chairs that we're looking to use in our, our worship center here. I've heard some churches say it takes six months to get chairs in here. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. 
And so uh, we want to start as soon as we can. Next Sunday is Commitment Sunday. We'll take the gift that we have on that Sunday morning and start to place orders, get our contractors lined up, and all of the go- those good things. Now, these commitment cards are in uh, the foyer at our generosity table, Legacy for Generations. It walks you through here. If you're given a one-time gift, if you're going to give monthly throughout the 25-month campaign, what all that looks like, it's there. Now, if you have not started praying over this, we encourage you this week to do that. In fact, at the table, there is a discussion guide for you and your family. Involve your kids. Our, our children's department, they're giving a gift. Our student ministry, I think they committed $3,000 among our teenagers that they want to participate. Go home and involve your whole family. Pray about this and discuss. But there's a discussion guide that will walk you through the questions, the scriptures, and all of those things. We want to give you every resource possible. But um, those are at the table. These commitment cards are at the table. You'll notice at the table there's also a, a, a sign-up board for prayer. This week we're asking you and your family to be praying over next week's commitment. But on Friday we are going to start a 24-hour round-the-clock prayer vigil. We have people already signing up for every hour of the day, through the night, through the middle of the night. We are going to pray for 24 consecutive hours as a church. And we would love to have you join us in that. You can go to the table and sign up. They'll give you time slots. You can pick time slots whatever works for you. And then Friday night, if you enjoyed worship this morning, Friday night, they're going to be doing a, a, uh, a night of worship. And so you can come and pray and do your slots and things and just stay right on for worship. We'd love to have you join us for that. But there is a lot going on in our church family. I am excited about what God's doing. And we are glad that you're here and a part of that. So let me pray over our morning and we'll get going. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for just knowing that you are an active participant in what's happening in our church family. Lord, I know we don't have all the answers, and we haven't got it all figured out. We certainly fall and stumble and make a mess of things sometimes, Lord. But I just thank you for Jesmond Christian Church. And I love my church family, and I believe we make a genuine difference in the community and the lives of those who are actively a part of our family. And just ask you continue to stir in our hearts and grow our faith stronger and Allow us again, Lord, to be a source of encouragement to those that you'll have cross our path this day and even this week, Lord. We love you. Pray you're honored with the conversations and our worship today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, that's great. I'm going to give you all kinds of scripture references. There is an outline. If you've not downloaded our app, we'll throw some of it on the screen. But I'm just going to be honest. We are B for Boogie today, and we've got a lot of ground to cover. So I'm going to give it to you. Some of it you're going to need to go home and just do some study on your own. Some of it I want to give context and help you better appreciate this conversation. But let me start by asking, did you know this? That it is the second greatest theme in all of the Bible, except for the salvation plan, except for the good news, except for, you know, the Jesus story. The second greatest theme in the Bible, did you know what that theme is? It. In fact, Jesus talked more about it than the subject of heaven or hell or prayer. It. That one out of six verses in the Gospels deal with it, this subject, In fact, half of all the parables and all the stories that Jesus tells talked about it. What is it? Do you know the subject I'm referring to? Say it louder. Giving, Giving, love. I heard several things there. Absolutely. The answer is yes, all the above. No, that's not right. The answer is giving. The answer is giving. And that's hard to imagine. Jesus spoke more about giving than heaven and hell. Yeah. He spoke more about giving than he he did about filling the blank. All of his parables, half of them had some reference to giving. It's kind of an important subject. And and in fact, if you understand giving, then you understand the very essence of Christianity because we know Jesus was a giver. In fact, if you study the Bible at all, eventually you're going to have to study this topic. You just cannot get around it. Let me give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. Some of those words that you were thinking that you did or you didn't call out, like the word believe, you know, believe, that's kind of, you would think, important to the Christian faith. You'd think the word believe is a pretty important word. It's used 270 times in the Bible, the word specifically believe. 
The word prayer, we all know the power of prayer. The prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If you grew up King Jimmy and you learned that as a kid, yes, prayer is important. 371 times it's used in the scriptures. How about the word love? Probably one of the most important topics, one of the most important teachings in all of Christianity is love. God so loved. It's used 714 times. If I'd kept Noah up here, I'd had a, a little drum roll. Drum roll, please. The word give is not used 272 times, not 371 times, not 714 times. The word give is used 2,162 times, almost twice as often as the word believe, pray, or love. Does that surprise anybody? It surprised me. I mean, I was a little bit shocked. That's pretty significant. If you don't understand God's standard and teaching on giving, then you don't completely understand God. In fact, you may not know Jesus as well as you think you do if you don't understand God's standard of giving. I mean, without this knowledge, you're out to lunch. I'm out to lunch. I would be clueless if I didn't understand the standard of God's giving. Jesus, in fact takes the idea and puts it all into one nice little package. It's in Matthew chapter 6, verse... Oh, it's not 6 and 39, is it? There are not... There's not 39 verses in Matthew chapter 6, in case you're wondering. Luke chapter 6 and 38. That's how important this, uh, the tech team are. They're in the back there. It's like, hey, Lee, between services, would you see me about this? It's like, I don't know how I typed it up. That's just what came... We're in the Gospels. That's the most important part. It's not Matthew. It is Luke, verse 38. Jesus is speaking, red letter edition. He says, give, and it will be given to you. For with the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. This is God's standard in giving. The verse sounds almost too good to be true, doesn't it? I mean, think about it for just a moment. Give, and it will be given back to you. I kind of like that plan. I don't know about you. I think that's pretty incredible. I almost think that's unbelievable, given it will be given back to you. I mean, I want in on that plan. I'm sure most of you at this point are sitting on the edge of your seat thinking, I want to know what is God's standard of giving. Given it will be given to you. For the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Question, how's God going to give it back, Right? What, what do I receive when I give to God? Well, today I'm going to ask, and I hope that we answer a couple of questions. My goal is two. For sure, I'm going to answer one. And here's the first question if you're taking notes. Why should we follow God's standard of giving? The scripture says, give and it will be given back to you for the measure you use will return to you. Why should I follow God's standard of giving? I know in this campaign, as we talk about a capital campaign, a generosity initiative, a whole lot of y'all been asking yourself that for several weeks. Well, I mean, I hear what Lee's saying, but why should I give? Fair question. Let me give you some of the benefits of giving today. Let me help you kind of appreciate. There's four benefits in your outline. I'm going to speak to one or two specifically. You can do a little homework on the others, but let me give you the benefits of following God's standard, not Lee's standard, not Jessamine Christian Church standard, not the standard that your church that you grew up in, not the standard your mama and your daddy gave you, not your traditions, not your practices, not any of those things. What is God's standard of giving? Here are some benefits. Number one, most importantly, I would even say, giving teaches me to put God first. Giving teaches me to put God first. I mean, isn't that the highest command? Isn't that the greatest command? If you know your commandments at all, isn't keeping God first and foremost? So, uh, that is our high calling. Love God, love people. The greatest command, New Testament even. But I'm using a text in Deuteronomy chapter 14 and verse 23. The, the scripture says, the purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your lives. I'd circle, highlight, underline that word teach. Or in the NIV, if you're using a New International Version, it says it is, the purpose of tithing is to help you learn. You know, we're talking about tithing. Learning to tithe. Teaching you to tithe. That's why we give. 
Because the truth is, God really doesn't need our money, does he? I mean, we are learning this. We are learning to hold him in high esteem. The NIV, it says, to revere him, to put him in first place. Folks, he's not some cosmic cash register. And he's like, well, now if you give me some money and you give me some money, and if this church gives me some money and that church gives me some money, I can put it all together and I can give it here and I can give it there and I can give it wherever I need to. No, God doesn't need our money. God owns it all. He is the creator He is our sustainer. He does not need our money. However, scriptures, he said, I want you. I want the people that I love. I want the people that matter to me. I want them to learn to give so they can remember that I am first in their life, that I am first place, that I am the Lord of their life. Now, if we could just be honest with ourselves for a few moments, and this is not always easy, but if we're honest with ourselves in our lives right now, in your life, be honest. In the life of your family, your circle of friends, you think about the community, you watch the evening news, whatever this looks like. But be honest, there's a real struggle going on about who has first place in our lives, about who's going to be number one. Is it the creator or the creature? And that's a struggle. God, you're Lord. I'm willing to follow you. Jesus said, give so we can show God in a tangible way that he's God and we are not. And that he's running the show and his ways and his thoughts are more lofty than ours. I'll give you a bad illustration, but it's what came to my mind. So it's what you're going to get, especially in light of our seasons have kicked off. If you're a football or basketball fan and I was talking to you in the foyer and asked what you love about the Kentucky Wildcats and you're like, oh, I love, I love basketball. We won't even say UK. We'll just say basketball in general. What do you love about basketball? Do you have any, you collect, you collect anything? You got any memorabilia? How many jerseys? You wearing the Jordan tennis shoes? You know, how much do you love basketball? Well, no, I don't really, I don't really Spend a lot of money on those things. Well, you got season tickets. You, go, you like to go to the games. You know, how often do you go to the games? You got any uh, of the right TV subscriptions? You know, you got, it used to be, what is it, SEC, but now there's like an SEC. Now you got to add the plus. Or it used to be, oh, you go to ESPN. No, no, now it's got to be ESPN plus. And, no, I don't really have those subscriptions. And you're thinking as you talk to the guy, does, does the guy really love basketball or not? Because, I mean, he's not... It's not showing in his wallet. It's not showing in his time. It's not, it's not reflected in his energy. This guy really is not a real lover of Kentucky basketball like I thought he was. And here's the deal. I meet, all, I meet people all the time. Even this week at the retreat, there's 100 men from all these different churches. I'm talking to them all. And yes, I'm on fire for God, and they're so excited about the retreat. And then, and only the Lord knows I don't, but I do know that many and most are just tipping God financially, throwing God a five spot here or there in the offering, that they're giving the Lord leftovers of their time and of their energy. They don't really attend church regularly, national average 1.8, not even two times a month are we going to church. And yet they maintain their Christians, they maintain their love the Lord, that they're born again believers, but their time, their finances, their energy just doesn't reflect that. It's a test, I believe, in so many ways of who we are and what we believe in in our faith. And the purpose of tithing, according to the Scripture, is to teach us, to help us to learn, to always revere and to put God in first place as what He deserves and what He asks and what He requires. And so when you're reading in the Gospels in Matthew 6 and verse 21, it says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, that's where your money follows. That's where your heart is going to be. If your money is invested in entertainment, or maybe it's in your hobbies or in your recreation, guess what? If your money is all tied up in house and property and real estate, then guess what? If your money is in cars and having the right kind of car, the right color of car, the right shape, the right speed of the car, you know. In my case, it's food. I'm a foodie. I love to eat. I was just telling someone I got a big old brisket I'm ready to cook. Last Thanksgiving, I had a full beef tenderloin we cooked. I mean, I've got three or four racks of ribs right now in my freezer because there's a peanut butter and jelly recipe for making ribs, and I'm wanting to try it out. So, I mean, you know, I can look. I know where I like to eat, 
and how often I eat out. I like to eat before I eat sometimes, and that's a real true story. <laughs> and that's what it is. Where is your heart? Where your treasure is? That is where your heart is. God says, put your money, put your resources where I am. Why should we follow God's standard of giving? Giving teaches us, put God first. Now, there's a lot of other reasons. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but in your notes, I want you to have them. And I think they are important. Some of them we understand. Why should we follow God's standard of giving? Giving prevents us from being materialistic. Giving prevents materialism. Now, keep in mind, if you get number one right, it takes care of everything else, right? Because I know people who are great givers. I know people who are super generous. And and generous givers are not materialistic. Giving has a way of preventing materialism. You think about the book of Genesis in the very beginning. The book of Genesis tells us that we were put on creation for one reason, and that is to manage and to take care of this world that we live in. To manage and take care of God's creation. Folks, at the end of the day, we have to remember he's the owner. We are the manager. That word for manager is also the same word that we use for stewardship. That is the essence of Christianity. And we struggle in this world and we make a mess of this life because we get our roles confused. Who's the creator and who's the creature? What is our role? What is our job assignment? We are to begin to manage God's creation. We begin to kind of run this thing around and and suddenly we start thinking, oh, it's all mine. We turn these things around. Oh, it's it's mine that I'm going to take care of it and I'm going to keep it for myself. And we get confused real quick. And God says, hey, hey, don't remember who's first. Don't remember remember who's first place. And so when Timothy and Paul are having a conversation in 1 Timothy chapter 6, The scripture says, command those who are rich. Oh, you think, well, I'm off the hook, right? Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth. Command them, the rich, to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And in this way, the scripture says, they will take hold of the life that is true, truly life. Now, who is rich? I just happen to know because I've been traveling and have traveled. I've been in several different mission trips, mission fields. I've been to Africa several times. I've been to Haiti, which is one of the poorest in all the Western Hemisphere. They say it's not the third, it's the fourth. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, third world living is four, It's like fourth world living. It's so poor. And I've seen some of this in my very own self. But if you're here today and you have more than a couple of outfits... If you have more than just a change or two of clothes, then guess what? You are loaded. You are rich. I'm talking mega bucks. I'm talking about lifestyle for the rich and famous, every one of us in this room. I know what your all's houses look like because I got one. And I got a closet that is just for all my hunting gear and all my golf gear and all my softball gear and my suits when I do a wedding or a funeral. I do own a couple of them. I have a closet just for that. Then I got a closet for just my golf shirts and my short sleeve and my summer. And I rotate those with my fall flannels and all the jackets and all the things. I got a sleeve over here that's just for all my ball caps. I got a rack of all my shoes. Does anybody else? Am I the only one? <laughs> you lie like a rug. My wife says, Lee, you got a problem. I'm like, you don't understand the seasons and the sports. There's reasons. My grandmother, she's dead, so I could tell this story. Otherwise, she'd whip me. She had a closet that was just shoes, a walk-in closet, just shoes from top to bottom, and every one of them was still in the box that she bought them in. I mean, she knew exactly where everything was. You see what I'm saying? If you've got more than a couple of outfits, a couple of things that you can change, a couple of clothes, you are wealthy. So God's word encourages me not to put my hope in wealth because it's so uncertain. The scripture says, command them, the rich, we've identified that's us. Command them, the rich, to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous, to be willing to share. I would circle that word share. 
Because in this way, the text says, because in this way, you can take hold of life, what is true life. We should follow God's standard of living. There are benefits from it. I know it's not equal gifts, but it's equal sacrifice. If you weren't here last week, you can go listen to the message on sacrifice. We can't all give the same. But the challenge is 100%. Can we all do something? Can we all find a way sacrificially to commit to and help support the legacy for generations? Giving teaches us to put God first. Giving prevents us from materialism. Giving, number three, strengthens our faith. Malachi 3 and verse 10 is probably one of the most popular passages of scriptures when you talk about giving. But the scripture says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. The word tithe, if you've been in church long enough, you've heard, we know that that's a 10% of your salary, of your benefits, of your bonuses, whatever that looks like, 10%. Bring that to the storehouse. That word storehouse is what we would understand as being the local fellowship, or it is what we would call the church. So bring the whole tithe into the place where you are worshiping and serving together. And if you keep reading the text, the scripture goes on and says, test me in this. Bring the whole tithe to the storehouse. God says it's one of the only times that he says, test me in this. Just try me. Just take the risk. I always say, dare to tithe one month. Just give it one month. You dare to tithe and see if the Lord won't bless you. In fact, I've gotten in trouble before because I said at the end of the month, if you can't pay your bills, you bring them in and the church will help you figure that out. Finance team loves it when I say things like that. (laughs) Test me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessings that you'll not have enough room for it. Folks, giving, it strengthens our faith. Last one before I get in trouble, I'll keep moving. Number four benefits here. Giving is an investment in eternity. That's why we're calling this a legacy for generations. Giving is an investment for eternity. Now, God's going to give us some inside information here in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse 18, the scripture says, Give happily to those in need. Always be ready to share with others what God has given to you. Then the scripture says, And by doing this, by doing this, you will be storing up what is real treasure for yourself in heaven. That's the idea. Giving is an investment for all of eternity. It's the only safe investment for eternity. You can't take it with you, but you can send it ahead. Now, how do you send it ahead? I'm glad you asked. Let's talk about that for a few moments. If you invest your money in people who are going there, guess what? Giving is an eternal investment. There's no risks involved in investing in kingdom work. How do we follow God's standard of giving? Here's another couple of three or four bullet points if you're taking notes. How do we do this? How do we follow? If we know we're called to give, now how do we follow the standard? Number one, it needs to be willing. Nobody can twist your arm. No one can sweet talk you into it or make you feel guilty. Giving, you should, it should come willingly. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. It says, For if the willingness is there... It doesn't say the wealth. It says if the willingness, not the wealth, if the willingness is there, then the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he doesn't have. Okay, are you with me? You see, God's not looking at what the size of the gift is. He's looking at the sacrifice that we make. What is the sacrifice? For Johnny and I, our sacrifice is going to look different than your sacrifice. But I'm encouraging you to go home, use the discussion guide, pray about it, talk about it with your family. Decide in your heart and for yourself what you should give to the campaign. How do we follow God's standard of giving? You got to want to. You got to be willing. It's got to be in your heart. Number two, you got to give graciously. Psalm 116, the scripture says, How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness? We just sang the song, Thank you, Lord. It's, it's simple to understand, to appreciate. Let me give you an example that's maybe even too simple. Have you ever thought about this? I have because, again, I have done a lot of mission trips. We're trying to go to Guatemala in February. If you want to go with us, you want to have your eyes open to what God's doing in other places of the world, see me about that. But 
in, uh, when I'm traveling overseas and I'm there, I think to myself, and maybe you have as well, who decided where you would be born? Think about that. Who decided where you'd be born? That you were born in this country, in this situation, in the family that you have, in the circle of friends, having the gifts and the abilities and the resources and the blessings that you have today, who made that decision? It was God. God is our creator. God in his sovereignty, he decided where you would live, how long you would live. What does that look like? You could have just as easily been born in Haiti or Bangladesh. But God decided, because of his infinite wisdom, for his love, for his purpose, for you, for us, that we would be born in the United States of America. You ever thanked him for that? You ever let him know how grateful you are for that? Because we are spoiled, and we are blessed, and we are rich, I can guarantee you. The question is, have you ever thanked him for that? How do we follow God's standard of giving? We give willingly. We give graciously, out of gratitude. Number three, we give regularly. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2, it says, One of every, or On every Lord's Day, each of you should put aside something of what you have earned during the week. I'm not going to spend a lot of time about this, but there is a difference between your tithe and an offering. The tithe is the 10% that you bring to the storehouse, to your local church body, and you give that regularly, yes. But an offering is something, and we are talking about what is above and beyond your tithe. We are asking in this campaign that you would make a 25-month uh, 25-month commitment. It's not going to go on forever. It's going to go on how long? I've got it on the calendar. We've got a little in our own house. We've already started. We're going to have to mark these things down so we know that we're reaching our goals along the way. We have 25 months to fill our commitment. There's a difference between our regular tithe that we're bringing each week, each month, however that looks for you, and this offering that is above and beyond our general giving. But the Scripture teaches us we should be giving regularly. We should be giving graciously. We should be giving willingly, regularly, whatever one I missed, fill in the blank. Let me give you the last one. I know I'm done. We should be giving generously. Scriptures, there's so many. There are so many scriptures. I feel like, man, it's like scripture overload. Second Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6, give generously, a legacy for generations. The scripture says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. Listen, when a farmer goes out to plant his field, he doesn't plant 10 acres and expects to reap 100 acres of harvest, does he? No, he knows better than that. When you sow 15 acres, you're going to reap 15 acres. You sow 1,000 acres, you're going to reap 1,000 acres. You sow negativity or criticism, guess what? That's what you're going to reap. Or if you sow encouragement, you're going to reap encouragement. That is the question. What are you going to sow? What are you sowing? Whatever you sow, that is what you're going to reap. Now, if I could get personal with you for a few moments as I kind of start to wrap this up. This is never easy, never popular, never fun. But I also believe as your pastor that we lead by example. I'm not suggesting everybody in the room needs to do this. I'm doing this for a couple of reasons. One, I think it's, there's a biblical foundation for me sharing in this information. And two, I want everyone in here to know that I'm not asking you to do something that Johnny and I aren't willing to do ourselves. Our goal in the Legacy for Generations is to ask every member in our church family to make a sacrificial gift, whatever that looks like for you. 100% we're challenging everyone. What does it mean to sacrifice? That was last week's message. I encourage you to listen online. But the definition I gave, sacrifice is giving up something you love for something you love more. What are we sacrificing? What are we sacrificing is nothing. Please don't miss this. Our sacrifice is nothing compared to how much God loves us. Our sacrifice is nothing in comparison for our love for the Lord and for our church family. Johnny and I, we want to do our part in the $1.2 million. We want 
the amount that we're giving to be sacrificial so it'll be authentic and real for us. The amount we've decided to give is going to be tough for us to reach. But we also know that God honors sacrifice. I called Johnny. She wasn't in town in Cincinnati. Hey, babe, be thinking. We're going to have to make this commitment. It's coming up. Get a number in your mind. She's like, well, what are you thinking? I'm like, I'll get a number also, and we'll talk later. We had this conversation. What are you thinking? The number that we originally came up with, we said, oh, we can look at the math. I did the math. Yeah, we can do this. Well, if we can do it, (laughs) the Lord's not in it. She said, you got to increase the number beyond what we can do ourselves. And so we did. We gave a number. We raised the number. We thought it was a genuine sacrifice. It's not easy for us to do. Basically, we thought about Wayne Smith. If you grew up in this area, you know what Wayne Smith says. When you have a number, double it. And so for us, we were just thinking to ourselves, here's what our tithe is. What would it look like if we just doubled our tithe? If we went from 10% to 20% of our giving for the next 25 months, That's a commitment that we are making to our church family. It requires a step of faith. It's going to require some sacrifice. But we believe for the next 25 months, we can increase our giving to 20%. It is the largest financial gift we've ever given to the church. Next Sunday, on Commitment Sunday, we'll give a one-time gift. More than what we've ever given to the church on one given Sunday. We are excited about that. That's how much we believe in the work that God is doing in Jessamine Christian Church. We want to leave a legacy for generations. Now, how are we going to give the 20%? We got to get creative on this, right? Johnny and I were looking at our budget. We were figuring out, well, here's what we tithe. We were actually giving more than a tithe, so we shifted some of those dollars around. We looked at, uh, we always get a tax return. We always celebrate that. We usually have a family vacation. Okay, we can give that up. We can give our tax returns. We all have deep stuff we need to declutter online. Y'all see our stuff on Facebook. Be generous, buy it all, you know, because it's going back to the campaign. We decided we could do without the ESPN pluses or the SEC pluses or the, you name the subscription that we, you got and we have too many of them. We could tighten our budget. We could eat out instead of, Four Sundays, we could eat out two Sundays or one Sunday. She's already started lunch at home today. Don't invite me to go out to eat. I mean, we're going home to eat. We also said, and Lord, please forgive me for this. Well, I said it. Johnny didn't. We could stop giving so many extra gifts to the grandkids. <laughs> yeah. Every time we see them, we're going to the Kroger. Papa, I want a toy. No, you're not getting a toy. Why can't I have a toy? Johnny's like, why'd you say that to him? I said, because I'm not buying him a toy. He did come out with a toy, (laughs) but I didn't buy it. (laughs) You see, you get the idea, folks. Everybody can do something. We can't all do the same thing, but we can all do something. And I know it won't be easy for you, and it won't be easy for us. There are a lot of things I could do 20% with. I know I got to pay my house off before I retire. In fact, I have to do my own retirement. I have my own, and I got to be increasing it. And there's vacations when you want to get time away with family. There's a lot of things that we could do. However, the finest use of 20% is to spend it on the things that are going to outlast us. Amen? For all of eternity, we believe that sacrifice is giving up something we love for something we, give, we love more. Now, I don't know how you're going to respond to this. I've taken a risk, but I'm willing to take the risk and share these things with you. It's not necessarily been easy, but I believe with all my heart it's the right thing to do and that I needed to do that. I want you to know how much I love you. I cannot make the commitment on your behalf, but I will start praying with you and I'll encourage you to be praying with me this week about how God might lay it on your heart to be sacrificial and giving to this legacy for generation. To give courageously next November the 5th, next Sunday, with a one-time gift, the largest you ever given to the church, give courageously. Give consistently for the next 25 months to see this renovation through. And give creatively like Johnny and I have figured out. There's always a little wiggle room in our budget. But I pray, I pray, I pray that you'll join us in this journey. Father, as we do bow our heads in prayer, Father, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus and for the sacrifice he's made for us. Jesus, in the next few weeks, the next few months, the next couple of years, our people are going to sacrifice and they're going to give up from 
some very special things in their life in order to give you the best that they have. They're going to take those sacrifices, Lord. I pray you'll take them and you'll bless them and you'll multiply them. And then, Father, we're going to stand by and we're going to see what only you can do when your people truly trust you with their sacrifices. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.